Good evening, everyone. I'm now going to do a talk on uh, the spirit of teaching of the Gnostics. It's a, it's a talk I gave a few years back, and um, I've got most of the talk back together again. There may be some, some little parts missing, but I might be making it into a coherent whole to listen to. So let's breathe out any, any tension and let's relax. Let's forget everything that's gone before this moment and just live in the moment. Um, I'm going to look at it, look at the spiritual teaching of the Gnostics from a theosophical viewpoint. There are lots of other viewpoints and writers who probably may have an even deeper understanding, but I'm going to look at what theosophy says about about the um, about these Gnostics. <clears throat> so the word gnosis itself means merely knowledge. That's true knowledge of things spiritual not um, intellectual knowledge. And so all the great adepts of the world, whether they were attached to esoteric Christianity, Buddhism, Hinduism, Taoism, Sufism, paganism, whatever, esoteric Christianity, um, they could be referred to as Gnostics in the truest sense. However, the word has come to be associated with a certain class of philosophers who lived and practiced in the Middle East in the first centuries after the death of Jesus, or the so-called death of Jesus. In her book, The Gnostic Gospels, Elaine Pagels brings to our attention the different views of the Gnostics as opposed to the more orthodox Christians. These views are expressed in the recently discovered Gnostic Gospels at Nag Hammadi. These bring out clearly the fact that most of the Gnostic sects at the time believed that the real Jesus did not actually die on the cross, only his physical body did. And it's a different viewpoint completely of what we mean by death. This riled the Orthodox Christians to whom the fact that Jesus did actually die for our sins was central to their whole belief system. It also annoyed them that many of the Gnostic sects thought it foolish for Christians to martyr themselves for the cause. These Gnostics knew a great deal about the real Christ and knew that what these so-called Christians um, were doing was foolish and a waste of energy that could be directed towards better ends. What this true Christ is was explained by H.P. Blavatsky in her article, The Esoteric Character of the Gospels, where she writes, the coming of Christ means the presence of Christos in a regenerated world, and not at all the actual coming in body of Christ Jesus. This Christ is to be sought neither in the wildernesses, nor in the inner chambers, nor in the sanctuary of any temple or church built by man. For Christ, the true esoteric saviour, is no man, but the divine principle in every human being. He who strives to resurrect the spirit crucified in him by his own terrestrial passions and buried deep in the sepulchre of his sinful flesh. He who has the strength to roll back the stone of matter from the door of his own inner sanctuary, he has the risen Christ in him or her. The son of man is no child of the bondwoman flesh, but verily of the free woman spirit. The child of man's own deeds and the fruit of his own spiritual labor. So this is very much the way that the Gnostics viewed the Christ, because the teachings that they followed did not suddenly appear on the arrival of Jesus, any more than Jesus's teachings were unique to him. They were the continuation of teachings that had been around for countless centuries. At the time that Jesus is reputed to have been alive, there were many sects about. So these teachings uh, were, were the esoteric knowledge of the time. It is likely that many of these were Buddhist orientated, like the Essenes, who were strict ascetics and had various levels of initiation. H.P. Blavatsky in Isis Unveiled, one of her books, says that the Gnostics or early Christians were but followers of the old Essenes under a new name. She also writes in that same book concerning a letter of Lentulus, the senator to the Roman Senate 
concerning the personal appearance of Jesus. He says that the hair of Jesus is represented in it as wavy and curling, flowing down upon his shoulders and as having a parting in the middle of the head after the fashion of the Nazarenes. If Jesus did wear his hair long and parted in the middle of the forehead after the fashion of the Nazarenes, then we have one more good reason to say that Jesus must have belonged to the sect of the Nazarenes and been called Nazariah for this reason, and not because he was an inhabitant of Nazareth, for they never wore their hair long. That's how it is unveiled to 151. And she adds to this in another of her books, The Secret Doctrine, the Nazarenes, who although they existed long before the days of Christ, and even before the law of Moses, were Gnostics, many of them initiates. They held their mysteries of life in the Nazareth, ancient and modern Nazareth. And their doctrines are a faithful echo of the teachings of the secret doctrine. So it is likely that the young Jesus, who obviously had an interest in spiritual matters, just like all of us who are watching this, would have attended meetings and lectures by various groups and lapped up the teachings given and probably was initiated into one of the orders, one of those that were around at the time. Today, a great deal is being written about the supposed early days of Jesus, but most of it is mere speculation and theory. Like most things that relate to the lives of great spiritual leaders, it is difficult to disentangle the truth from fiction and symbology from actual fact. And it can be just a waste of energy to try to do so. Unless we are able to look into the astral light and see exactly what did go on and be sure that it is genuine insight and not just our own or someone else's imagination. It is much safer to inquire into the actual teachings of these Gnostic sects, which are able to be, to be related to earlier or later sects believing the same. So with this in mind, let's try to get some idea of what they actually taught. Kenneth Mackenzie, in his Royal Masonic Cyclopedia, says about Gnosticism, there was a period of a priori knowledge, which fostered by the ideas of Proclus and its school, itself founded upon Platonism, intermingled with the more recondite mysteries in the East, in which a powerful and singular sect of philosophers arose called Gnostics. Gnosticism was very attractive to minds imbued with mystical ideas and semi-pantheistic in its nature. It sought to purify its disciples from the corruption of matter and elevate them to a higher scale of being, suited only to them who were to become perfect by knowledge. So this hints at the fact that Gnosticism was nothing new and that it was merely the continuation of a body of knowledge that had been in existence for many, many thousands of years. Again, to go back to Isis Unveiled by H.P. Blavatsky, in this she also emphasises this point when she is writing about Eastern influences on the Gnostics. She says, except for a few impartial archaeologists who trace a direct Buddhist element in Gnosticism, as in all those short-lived sects, we know of very few authors who in writing upon primitive Christianity have accorded to the question its due importance. Have we not facts enough to at least suggest some interest in that direction? Do we not learn that as early as the days of Plato, there were Brahmins? read Buddhist, Samanians, Saman or Shaman missionaries in Greece, and that at one time they had overflowed the country. Does not Pliny show them established on the shores of the Dead Sea for thousands of ages? After making every necessary allowance for the exaggeration, we still have several centuries BC left as a margin. 
And is it possible that their influence should not have left deeper traces in all these sects than is generally thought? That's from volume two, page 321 of ISIS. And now to turn to The Secret Doctrine, another book by H.P. Lovatsky. She writes in this that each of these sects was founded by an initiate, while their tenets were based on the correct knowledge of the symbolism of every nation. 2389, volume 2389. In ISIS Unveiled, several of these Gnostic systems are given out. One is taken from the Codex Nazarius, scripture of the Nazarenes, who, although they existed long before the days of Christ and even before the law of Moses, were Gnostics, and many of them initiates, as I've said before. They held their mysteries of life in Nazareth, ancient and modern Nazareth, and the doctrines are a faithful echo of the teachings of the secret doctrine, some of which I know we are now endeavouring to explain. That's a bit of an extension of what I've quoted earlier. That's from 2, 96, volume 2, page 96. Uh, one important element in Gnosticism, in opposi opposition to Orthodox Christianity at the time, is its acceptance of woman as the equal of man, and also the reverence that they held towards the feminine aspect of the universe. Elaine Pagels again writes of one of these sects, the Valentinians, who were followers of Valentinus, a Gnostic teacher of the time. And she says that he suggests that the divine can be imagined as a dyad, consisting in one part of the ineffable, the depth, the primal father, and in the other of grace, silence, the womb, and the mother of all. Valentinus reasons that silence is the appropriate complement of the father designating the former as the feminine and the latter as the masculine because of the, of the grammatical gender of the Greek words. He goes on to describe how silence receives, as in a womb, the seed of the ineffable source. From this she brings forth all the emanations of divine beings, reigns in harmonious pairs of masculine and feminine en energies. So the mother of the universe was called by them the mystical eternal silence. The mystical eternal silence. The Orthodox Christians were extremely annoyed that women were given equal billing with men in some Gnostic sects, as their God was definitely masculine, very much the Old Testament patriarch. I'm trying to avoid as much as possible in this talk and going too deeply into Gnostic cosmology, as it's a very complex subject and would need probably more of a study course than a short lecture. And I'm trying to concentrate more on the spiritual teachings. However, it is interesting to note in respect of the above quotation, that these female and masculine energies seem to be identical to the teaching connected to yin and yang, in Chinese philosophy, and the feminine regarded as a mystical eternal silence and the womb of all to the esoteric teachings connected to Kuan Yin, outwardly the goddess of compassion, but inwardly the divine voice of the higher self, connected also to the Jewish Bath Kol, the daughter of the divine voice, and the Hindu Vach, the goddess of speech or the word. All expressions of the feminine force in nature, and also the magic potency of occult sound in nature and ether, which voice calls forth Xian Qian, the elusive form of the universe out of chaos and the seven elements. And the last couple of sentences were from SD1, page 137. And this idea is also expressed again in Isis Unveiled, to page 225 where it says the ish amon, the pleroma of the boundless circle within which lie all forms, is the thought of the power divine. It works in silence and suddenly light is begotten in darkness. It is called the second life and this one produces or generates the third, 
This third light is the father of all living things. As Iwa, E-U-A, is the mother of all that lives. He is the creator who calls inert matter into life through his vivifying spirit and therefore is called the ancient of the world. Abateur is the father who creates the first Adam, who creates in his turn the second Abateur. Abateur opens a gate and walks to the dark water, which is chaos. And looking down into it, the darkness reflects the image of himself and lo, a sun is formed, S-O-N. The Logos of the Demiurge, Fiatil, who is the builder of the material world, which is called into existence. According to the Gnostic dogma, this was Metatron, the Archangel Gabriel, or messenger of life. Whereas the biblical allegory has it, the androgynous Adam Cadmon, again, the son, who with his father, a spirit, produces the anointed, or Adam, before his fall. So in esoteric teaching, Adam Cadmon is the archetypal mankind. So it's very complex, maybe. So from then on, H.P. Wolbatsky goes on to compare the Gnostic cosmological system with that of the Egyptians and the Brahmins. Well, this become, can become so complex that it is really beyond the scope of this, of this talk. But anyone interested in the subject you can look it up in, um, online uh, on the internet. There's lots of information on the so follow it up for themselves. A short talk like this can only act as a springboard to our own studies and meditations. Suffice to say that the identity of the many different systems worldwide is comparatively easy to prove. The same essence in all different systems. This is what unites us, what unites us in the brotherhood of humanity. The fact that it's just the externals that, that separates. And isn't it true in all aspects of life? So one of the most widely accepted and practical teachings of all the major religions and philosophical systems is that the mind is the cause of our bondage and also the means to free ourselves from all our mind forged manacles, as William Blake put it. So the Buddha says in the Dhammapada that what we are today comes from our thoughts of yesterday and our present thoughts build our life of tomorrow. Our life is the creation of our mind. So, so whichever way we want to look at it, we want to look at life, that, that's what we create. And countless other Buddhist sutras expand on this idea magnificently. There's also the superb secret of the golden flower. And I have the um, Thomas Cleary translation, which I much prefer, which is one of the most comprehensive and profound manuals of meditation available to the public. But slowly but surely, the adepts of the world are releasing more teachings. What we have is just the tip of the iceberg. The secret of the golden flower tells us how to turn our mind away from its involvement with so-called externals and to center it within, to transform the mind so that it becomes the celestial mind or the illumined mind. In theosophy, we talk about manasa tajasa, which is the mind illumined by buddhi or the intuition, the illumined mind. Also in theosophy, we talk about the higher and lower aspects of the mind and say that our future spiritual progress depends on whether the mind gravitates upwards towards the spiritual ego or becomes entangled with lower desires uh, and uh, passions. The Yoga Sutras of Patanjali teach us how to prevent the mind being modified by its identification with the outer world. And the Bhagavad Gita instructs us in the method of centering our attention on the divine so that the mind becomes as steady as a candle flame in a spot free from wind. And the voice of the silence translated by H.P. Lovatsky tells us that the mind is the great slayer of the real. Let the disciples slay the slayer, meaning the lower aspects of the mind, of course. 
Many of the teachings of the Gnostic sects around during the first few centuries AD give credence to, this the to the theories of those that believe that these sects were influenced by Buddhist elements that were around at the time and begin to present us with a very different picture than the one that we get from Orthodox Christianity. So in the Nag Hammadi Library, a treatise entitled Teachings of Sylvanus says, bring in your guide and your teacher. The mind is the guide, but reason is the teacher, the higher reason. Live according to your mind, acquire strength, for the mind is strong. Enlighten your mind, light the lamp within you. Remember the Buddha, the Buddha said, be lamps unto yourselves. He also says, knock on yourself as upon a door and walk upon yourself as on a straight road. For if you walk on the road, it is impossible to go astray. Open the door for yourself that you may know what it is. Whatever you will open for yourself, you will open. So all this is very Zenish and Taoist, almost like a coin some parts. Another picture that all this makes clearer is that of Jesus. Instead of seeing him as some kind of supernatural being who is unique in the history of the world, we see him as just one more teacher in a long lineage that has spanned countless centuries and countless lands, all teaching the same, all pointing us in the same direction. And at last, a few people are beginning to realise this. I so we are getting books being published almost purely. At the time I wrote this, there's one called Lost Christianity by Jacob Needleman. Um, and even before that, there were authors who dealt with the subject, like William Kingsland and G.R.S. Mead, who were students of HPB and lived around the same time. And they did great pioneering work as regards breaking down the dogmatic hold of the organised Christian church. And of course, HP Blavatsky started the ball rolling, so to speak, or at least kept it rolling, would be a better, better way of putting it. So these two teachers wrote some interesting books. One was The Life of Joshua by Franz Hartmann, and the other, um, was Gnosis in the Christian Scriptures by William Kingsland. Franz Hartmann was another early theosophist. Um, and they make engrossing studies in themselves. And I would highly recommend them if you are able to obtain copies. So the, the one called on Jehoshua, Life of Jehoshua, I think it'd been out of print, but it may be back in print now, I haven't checked. You can check on, online. But it is interesting in that, in that it describes the probable initiation rites that Jesus may have, may have been through as a member of the Nazarenes. But again, we must not be led too far off our course. But suffice to say that these sects were said to teach the laws of karma and reincarnation, which are universal laws and not as many believe weird Eastern uh, doctrines. It's to do with nature processes of nature that are cyclic, day and night, waking, sleeping, uh, the seasons, everything works in cycles, birth, maturity, old age, death, and then rebirth. So if we are part of nature, much a part of nature as a tree or a flower, it's logical that we probably go through the same processes too. If we can see through the, to the essential teachings of all these books, it is assured us that we are, are our own saviors. We do not need intermediaries to work for us, nor do we need a, a Jesus or anyone else to take away our sins. We have to squarely face our own karma, and we have the spiritual strength within us to do this because we are microcosms of the macrocosm, and we have the strength of a universe of light behind us. More than sons of God, we are children of the light. As all the world's scriptures, like the Bhagavad Gita, the Upanishads, Secret of the Golden Flower, Tao Te Ching, Buddhist sutras, Sufi teachings, etc., and the esoteric Christianity teach, uh, um, teachings, Gnosticism, 
that it tells if we transcend the personal self and focus our attention in the divine, we can soon be free from the coils of the serpent of illusion and come to realize that each one of us is the way, the truth and the life. To truly tread the path, we have to become that path and not believe that it is something outside of us and that we have to rely on someone else, whether human or divine, to save us. That's a very degrading idea. The Father in secret that Jesus is said to, to have mentioned is our own higher self. And it is that to which we should pray, if that is the right word to use, and meditate. We must come to understand that, that each one of us in, in, in watching this in the world around us, are totally responsible for their own spiritual progress. And because of the spiritual teaching that we all have identical origin, identical origin and that separateness is an illusion, we also affect others by our thoughts and actions. But we hold ourselves back and therefore everyone else by giving in to the medieval indoctrination that we are weak and miserable sinners. No worse thing has ever been put forward than that. Believe us that we are weak, miserable sinners. We are not that, but instead divine beings, able to communicate in our words, thoughts and acts, the divine harmony and compassion that lies at the very heart of the universe. So the Gnostics, like many other sects attached to many other religions, philosophies and systems of thought, attempted to express something that was a definite experience. It had nothing to do with dogmas gotten from books and people who had never experienced anything directly trying to force these dogmas on everyone else. Nothing is of any real importance, nor is it real until it is experienced. That is why all the truly mystical and esoteric schools like the Zen, Chan, Dewey, Sufis, Vedantins and Gnostics constantly warn us against becoming attached to the dead letter of the teachings and give us methods whereby we can reach direct knowledge of the truth by our own experience. We are all different and therefore thereby everyone in this, in this world has their own way of reaching the truth. There's no way that a standard handbook of, of rules and regulations that apply to everyone can be produced. We can be given advice, but we ourselves must decide whether that advice applies to us. What would help one person would certainly hinder another. One man or woman, food is another's poison. Don't think that because one person achieved enlightenment by certain practices, that if we imitate those practices, that we will achieve the same results. I said, we are all different. There are basic principles to follow, but we have to apply them in our own way. The secret doctrine it says by self-induced efforts and, and, and methods, self-induced self efforts, self-devised methods, whichever. <laughs> so we have to find our own way. It says in Zen, a thousand monks, a thousand ways. And this is what the Gnostics of all times and cultures have tried to get across. But the world is full of the blind leading the blind. And there are always those who will try to obscure the truth. These are generally people who are very materialistic, though many of them would deny that. And they are more interested in their personal selves than the enlightenment of humanity. These people cannot and will not see beyond the written word. And therefore they try to enforce the dead letter on people who are unable to think for themselves for some reason because they saw it engrossing working for a living. And on the other end of the scale, people who are way beyond the written word, they'll try to drag them back to the written word. Nowadays, the reason is an obsession with physical work and the belief that earthly comforts derived from the fruits of, of, of this obsession are all that is needed for success in the world. Therefore, the thinking, so-called, is left to the scientists or the theologians, and most people accept what they say without any question. 
changing opinions like they change their clothes, condemning someone one day and praising them the next, if the so-called intellectuals tell them to. So it was in Jesus's time, for example, note how the crowds so quickly turned against him during his reputed trial, when they called for Barabbas instead of him. Public opinion is noticeably fickle, and this is why we need to find the saviour within our own hearts to reach the safe, safety of our inner sanctuary. And this is the only safe place where we can know for certain what the real truth is. If we rely on books, we will doubt in the end. If we rely on people, no matter how enlightened we think they are, we may become disappointed. To go back to Franz Hartmann in, in his book, Joshua, the prophet of Nazareth says, as long as men crucify the truth and keep it hanging between superstition and doubt, the two thieves that steal the reason of man away, they will not be able to become self-conscious of its divinity. To obtain self-knowledge of the truth, man must be one with it and exalt it by exalting himself above the sphere of credulity into the region of pure spiritual knowledge. Eternal truth is immortal and cannot be grasped by mortal man. It can only be known to that principle which is immortal in man. The truth can only be known to itself. So writing of the true theosophists and Gnostics throughout the ages, H. P. Blavatsky says in the esoteric character of the Gospels, whether heathen or Christian by birth, they refuse to materialise and thus degrade that which is the purest and grandest ideal, the symbol of symbols, namely the immortal divine spirit in man, whether it be called Horus, Krishna, Buddha or Christ. And I would recommend you to perhaps look at that article. It's very, very interesting. It can be found easily online. So the gnosis or the knowledge is the true knowledge of our own nature, which can only be understood by experience, by living the life of Christos, or a good man, until the day that we can become as Jesus was, Christos, the anointed. Mere baptism does not give us the right to call ourselves Christians any more than joining the Theosophical Society gives us the right to call ourselves Theosophists. It is interesting to note that the name Jesus was a title of honour, in the same way that Christos was, or is, and was not his actual name. These ideas, which may have been unusual when first given out over a hundred years ago, are given credence by the Nag Hammadi Library, and in particular, the Gospel of Thomas, which helps to emphasise the universality of Jesus' teachings. Just as an aside, H.P. Lovatsky says in the Esoteric Character of the Gospels that Christos just means a good man, and you only have a right to call yourself Christ or Christos if you've been anointed, uh, maybe through the initiations. So when people call themselves Christians, it's a bit of a, <laughs> uh, taking a bit of a liberty, because they're really just Christians, um, which means a good man if they are good, a good man or a woman. So um, even despite the alterations that have taken place in the New Testament, we can still see the spirit of compassion shining through in Jesus's teachings. For example, the 25th verse of this book says, Jesus said, love your brother even as your own soul, guard him even as the pupil of your eye. That's very nice. Jesus said, love your brother even as your own soul. Guard him even as the pupil of your own eye. The whole of this book comes across as a wonderful synthesis of many different traditions of thought, Buddhism, Vedantism, Taoism, Judaism, which proves a lot of what I've said earlier about what the influences that were around at the time of Jesus. In this version of it that I'm quoting from, Hugh McGregor Ross has written some paraphrases of the originals, which give a more modern interpretation of some of the um, verses or logia. For example, the verse 70 says, Jesus said, when you bring forth that in yourselves, that which is yours will save you. 
If you do not have that in yourselves, that which is not yours will kill you. And this he paraphrases as, and he said, when you bring forth that which is inherently within yourselves, this which is yours will save you. If you do not acknowledge that within yourselves, the invasive ego will kill you, denying access to truth. So all through the ages, we have individuals or groups who feel within themselves the presence of the Christ principle or the Buddha principle or the Krishna principle, call it what you, you may, and try to live their lives in its light. But unfortunately, the majority of human beings do not develop this insight and are ruled by their lower thoughts and ideals by what is known in theosophical teaching as the great dire heresy of separateness that weans them from the rest. They live in the illusion of their personalities and therefore persecute those who have real insight. Many people throughout these ages who had genuine insight have been so persecuted, including those who have attempted to keep the Gnostic flame alive. People like Pico de Mirandello, Paracelsus, Robert Flood, even HPB was, and many more. Interesting point, and one expanded by H.P. Lovatsky in her article, The Esoteric Character of the, Character of the Gospels, and one that goes to prove the pre-Christian origins of Gnosticism, was included in Kenneth Mackenzie's Royal Masonic Cyclopedia under his explanation of the life and teachings of the Essenes. Talking about this sect during the early centuries AD, he says, the worship of Christ was not universal at this early date, by which I mean that Christology had not been introduced, but the worship of the Christos, the good principle, had preceded it by many centuries and even survived the general adoption of Christianity as shown on monuments still in existence. So something I, was, I just touched on earlier, in the esoteric character of the Gospels, H.P. Blavatsky goes into detail about the difference in meaning of the two words, Christos and Christos, which have been such a stumbling block for students and scholars throughout the, the ages. Christos, she says, means certainly more than merely a good and excellent man, while Christos was never applied to any one living man, but to every initiate at the moment of his second birth and resurrection. He who finds Christos within himself and recognises the latter as his only way becomes a follower and the apostle of Christ. Though he may never have been baptised, nor even have met a Christian, still less called himself one. It is on such misunderstandings that so many dissensions have arisen. Those who took neither the time nor trouble to look into the meaning of, of words and accepted things literally are just those who try to impose their opinions on others, who, as a result of their learning, have come to realise the importance of tolerance and the fact that there is nothing new under the sun, but that even the teaching of Jesus are just standard teachings of many sects that existed centuries before the birth of the so-called saviour. It's interesting to see that, you know, the Sermon on the Mount is very, very Buddhistic and his teachings of love your enemies and, and kindness and compassion. And in fact, Jesus went very much against the Old Testament um, teaching. The Old Testament is very Judaic. And he, he said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. You know, it, it, it kind of supports revenge. Where Jesus said, he says in the Old Testament, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those that curse you. Pray for those that despitefully use you, completely the opposite. So he was going, trying to go against um, that rather, the rather cruel teachings in the Old Testament and the, the Old Testament God, who was a very um, almost a bloodthirsty, bloodthirsty, vicious God. So it is very important to see things in this way, as it alters the whole focus of our attention and helps to rescue us from the idea that we have to be saved through intermediaries, as I said. It helps us also to realise that we are indeed divine beings, children of the light, denizens of eternity. 
Thank you very much. Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Peace, peace, peace. Peace on earth and goodwill to all beings, particularly in these difficult times. We will have peace on earth. If people just are positive, think peace, radiate peace, live peace. It doesn't take many people to change the world. Just people who are free from doubts. Hearts are full of peace, love, harmony. So let's do that for the good and benefit of all beings. And thank you very much for listening.